let's get started uh, stop of the hour uh, hello everyone welcome to today's webinar sponsored by cockroach labs and uh, infoq my name is uh, srini penchikala i am the lead editor at infoq for the ai ml and uh, data engineering community i will be the moderator for this webinar today we are going to hear from uh, jim walker from the cockroach labs team the presentation title is uh, how to match your workload to a cloud database let me introduce our presenter first jim walker currently works as a principal product evangelist at uh, cockroach labs he is a recovering developer turned evangelist who digs uh, useful cool cutting edge technologies he loves to translate and distill uh, complex concepts into compelling more simple explanations that broader communities uh, can consume he is an advocate of the developer and an active participant in uh, several uh, open source communities jim welcome to this webinar so with the growing adoption of microservices and uh, cloud native applications there is still one piece of the application architecture stack that needs to become cloud native and uh, that's the database so database hasn't uh, caught up uh, with the rest of the architecture uh, until now uh, similar to micro based uh, microservices based architectures cloud databases support the distributed application requirements like uh, scalability resilience and high availability and uh, bringing the data tier on par with the uh, other tiers in the application architecture uh, in this webinar today uh, jim will discuss how cloud databases are different from traditional database solutions and what you should as a developer as an architect as a devops engineer uh, what you should consider when choosing a cloud database before we go to the main presentation i would like to go over a couple of housekeeping items the main presentation will be about 30 to 35 minutes long after that we will have a 15 to 20 minute or even longer if you have time uh, of a q and a session where the presenter will respond to questions from the audience i'll be moderating the q and a throughout the presentation so if you have any questions during the presentation uh, please submit them in the q and a section of the webinar screen everyone's micro uh, microphones will be uh, muted by default except uh, the speakers the recording of this webinar will be available in the next couple of days uh, so you can watch it offline if you are interested uh, you will be receiving an email with the more details uh, that should be all for the housekeeping items jim i'm going to turn it to you now and uh, i will turn off my video very much you're looking forward to this presentation thank you yeah, thank thank you for that kind of introduction, and um, yeah, I'm I'm excited to give this talk. This is something that's near and dear to my heart, and you know, as we as we speak through these things and we think through you know cloud database and you know what does a database mean for kind of modern cloud applications, it isn't always cloud native. You know, I think you know what we're working on at Cockroach Labs, absolutely, it's cloud native. Like you could take advantage of cloud infrastructure, but you know, often you're just looking for the right database for your workload. And you know, I think there's a, a lot of options today in terms of what database you're going to use. Um, and I don't think we all like take into consideration all the things that that are important when we're choosing a database. I mean, this any database for any workload, honestly. And so this is is hopefully is a an impartial, uh, somewhat impartial uh, presentation. Of course, I'll tell you at the end, you know, how Cockroach does a lot of things, but like. You know, I think, you know, going through this material, it's, it's stuff that as developers, we should all be pretty well aware of. Because I think, you know, the way we make decisions and, and the decisions we make when we start to build our applications have long-term impact or long-term effect on, you know, the overall success of whatever the project is that, that you're working on. You know, I, I talk to a lot of people about, you know, oh man, like how, how can I, what's the magic bullet for just telling people about, you know, an application that runs global? I'm like, there, there is no magic bullet. Like, people have to experience, um issues and they have to experience problems or challenges or or successes and and going through kind of what those things are having some sort of like framework to to think through what those what those things are for your workload and your application is really what what this session is all about um today um so so again i i'm i'm jim as i srini has just introduced me uh, i thank everybody for being here this is kind of a beginner more or less session today i think this is some of the things you may think about today maybe you don't I hope there are some things here you don't think about. Um, if you want to engage with me directly, uh, you know, the Cockroach Lab Slack channel, the community Slack channel is great, um, but I'm also just at James on Twitter. 
uh, and so feel free to DM and connect and, and all that stuff. So, so how do we typically choose a database, you know, and so kind of when I coded, I basically just used whatever I used in my last project or what somebody else in the project had started using. Um, I, I think we, we often use like, oh, what did they teach me in college? What does my team know? Um, most, most developers I know just think about the problem in front of them. They don't go too deep into kind of like, oh God, what's the value of the database kind of provide for my application? And I think it's a little bit of a mistake because I think there's so much more to think about. Um, and there's so much more to think about in terms of, you know, the, the complexity or the, the long-term technical debt or, you know, what happens when I am successful and I have to manage this, this, this backend, which is actually a critical, critical, a critical component, you know, in the, in the introduction. Um, from Trini, we, we talked about, you know, becoming cloud native and how we've kind of re-architected our infrastructure to become cloud native and we're all kind of moving in that direction. You know, where, where does infrastructure end and, and our applications begin? And, and if we're cloud native, shouldn't that transcend infrastructure, go into the database as database infrastructure? Shouldn't that transcend to our, our applications themselves? And so, how do you become this kind of this conduit sometimes, right? And so that that's a wholly different story, right? And so, but there's there's just a lot to consider when we are kind of choosing, you know, what we want to build our application on. Because you know, look at ultimately, you know, it's funny. I you know, I, my friend Dan Goodman at, at Ultimate Tournament has a quote. It, it's, it's something along the lines of, you know, an application is nothing more than the interface between your users and a database. Which, oh man, Dan, man it from my heart, I love it, right? Because that's exactly how I think about things. Because I think ultimately that database is where, you know, the valuable nuggets of our businesses kind of land, and that is the data itself. And so choosing the right thing, I think, is, is pretty important. It, it seems like an easy decision to choose a database, um, but as I noted, you know, like, how, how do we do things faster? How do we avoid technical debt? How do we let the right layer deal with things? Uh, you know, do I need SQL? Do I need a document store? Do I need, you know, time series database? Um, do I need a graph database? I mean, really, it's going to come down to kind of what you're actually thinking about and what you want to accomplish. Now, I think familiarity and ease is, is one of the ways we choose a database. Uh, I think infrastructure and talking about cloud native, that's another thing that you need to take into, into consideration. Um, your workload and what you want to accomplish and then costs and, and the, the, the resources that are available to you. And so we'll talk through some of these things and, and hopefully this, this will help you kind of help choose and, and make more informed decisions around, you know, what database you use for, for whatever application you're going to do. I always like to start with application architecture. Um, you know, I, I like to see the big picture thing, uh, a big picture kind of, of how things are going to work ultimately in the end. You know, back in the day when I used to, you know, code, when I started coding, there was like an app that I ran and there was a database and actually it was, all on a, on a desktop that sat, you know, a desktop computer that sat underneath me, you know, at my desk. And I ran everything on one thing. And then, you know, I'll, maybe I ran the database on a separate machine, I was connecting to it, but you kind of have this kind of one-to-one -one type of relationship. I think what we've done, you know, really recently, we've really kind of accelerated towards, you know, really the, the you know, services and, and microservices and lots of different services accessing kind of one, you know, one database service, if you will. And I think ultimately we need to start thinking about, you know, where these things live. You know, are you going to go microservices or more simple? And then once you are microservices, are you are you spread out geographically across, you know, a, a, you know, a lots of different places with your compute, so you can maybe service users easily or you know survive failure of a region, these sort of things. And so like, I think you know where uh, the physical nature of our application architectures um, are also pretty important. It's not just the logical kind of you know, like layout of what things are going on. But I think that that physical thing, how and where things will run, um, do become pretty important in the overall context of how you choose your database. Because ultimately, you know, we're all going to have to actually deal with the speed of light in, in the third one, and we're going to have to deal with contention in, in the middle one there, right? And so I think these things are all pretty important. I think another big thing that's changed over the past two or three years is the way in which we deliver our applications. And and honestly, I, I use apps here because this is the way that these things used to work. Like we used to. We used to build something, we used to release it, people would buy it or download it, and then we'd install it on a server and, and away we go. That's all That's all really interesting. Um, but there's been challenges to the way that we used to do things, right? It's like, how do we get new releases out there? How do we understand reuse of this application? Um, you know, there's it's difficult to kind of troubleshoot when other people are hosting and dealing with these things. Um, you know, there's, there's no way to do any sort of consumption-based pricing or just, you know, pay for what you, pay for what you use, which, 
I think really has led to the advent of, of a new way of doing things. And, and today it's no longer application delivery. I don't, I don't think about like this, this old world of delivering apps. I think of, of, of provisioning apps and you know, it's, it's a service delivery. Because ultimately, the way that we all are consuming software today is a managed service. If you want push button, I don't want to install and deal with hardware and make all these things happen. Nobody, nobody wants to do that anymore. And and you know, I think that's the big change that's happened over the past couple of years. Like, we publish our applications to the cloud. People subscribe to them, and then we provision an instance. It's very different than release, buy, and install. Um, you know, this publish, subscribe, provision thing gets gets really interesting. And I think that's the way that people want to consume things today. You know, I've been in open source for a long time and it was funny, you know, and like 10 years ago with open source, it was like, God, you know, get these bits into the hands of people who are, what was in Hadoop, you know, it's like for a consumption point of view, it's like, great, get this stuff, install it, deal with it. But it was kind of like free pup. It was free, but it was like a free puppy. You had actually, you know, the long term maintenance of that thing. Well, with managed services, you know, we've kind of diminished all that pain. And we're allowing the the ISV or the cloud provider, or whoever it is that's dealing with this to actually deal with all those issues with us um but but this actually creates issues for us as well um you know where does application data live um how do i architect it so i'm do i have a shared database across you know all the instances that i've provisioned of my particular service or do i have a one-to-one -one, you know one service to one of the databases you know what's my system of record across all these different consumers that are that are accessing and, and using the service right is there data around the data for that particular service what's the metadata here um, how do we how do we actually charge people? How do we know what they're doing? You know, how do you set up a database in this world in terms of like its function in the context of what you're trying to do? And and that's beyond just you know uh, you know just the relational the relational database is what I like to think about a lot, but just any any sort of database that that the application is going to use. I think the the operational kind of metadata side of things is definitely kind of the, you know the the transactional relational stuff, right? And so I think that's where the, those things get pretty important. Um, so that's that's the, I, that's one thing to think about. You know, how are you going to actually deploy your services? I, I think another thing that that not everybody always thinks about is, you know, I'm going to build this great application. I you know I thought of it's like maybe it's like a birthday card application. All my friends are going to use to actually share birthdays and manage these things and understand when people you know get reminders so everybody gets you know understands when birthdays are coming. Whatever that is, and I have my business logic, and that's usually not all we're dealing with. Um, you know, typically in an application architecture, there's a lot more like, you know, maybe you're doing payment processing and you need to go off to Kafka, you use Kafka to go to some payment processor to, to, to pre-approve a transaction before you actually make a transaction happen. And then, you know, log that thing into your, your system of record or your financial ledger, you know, maybe you're syncing off into some reporting or visualization engine to see usage uh, at any one time. I, I mean, you know, gosh, everybody wants to talk about the data warehouse and business analytics. Um, I mean, the MLAI side of stuff, right? Like, how are you integrating with all, all these other services that your business and your application is going to use? You know, do you need additional tooling around your database? Um, you know, what is what is your ETL going to look like? Your extra, extract, transform, load, your data integration stuff. Are you using CDC so you can have like maybe an event-driven architecture? Does your database do that? Is it a separate tool? How hard is it to integrate? How hard is it to actually, you know, use those sort of things? Because ultimately, that's going to lead to you know increased operational overhead or it's going to simplify your life and so thinking through you know how the database is going to interact with all the things around it is a kind of critical decision point i think a lot of mature databases have all these kind of great things within them but as we evaluate what we're going to do for our app i think it's a very very important to evaluate you know how your database is going to integrate and what's going to go around it and then there's this, you know, I think Srini kind of, you know, uh, uh, talked about this in, in the intro, but, you know, how and where will you deploy that particular, that that application, whatever it is, you know, is it is it just like basically on some EC2 instance with a couple other servers, you know, and you're in, maybe you're hitting some, you know, shared cloud service, you know, like that, that's one way of doing it. Um, are you running this thing on Kubernetes? Are you taking your compute and all your services and running that on pod, in pods and, and controlling that via Kubernetes? Or do you want to, you know, and then, you know, accessing a service outside of that environment? Or do you want to run the database, you know, natively in Kubernetes as well? Are you cloud native at that point, right? Are you, you know, do you want to, you know, gain the benefits of, you know, this resilient nature of, of Kubernetes and, you know, kind of how it maintains the particular state of something? Uh, do you want to actually, you know, infer that and, and imply that into your database as well? 
you know, so ultimately there's like kind of three different ways you can avoid from the, from the cloud native point of view too. Um, you know, just purely not kind of this mixed world and then fully cloud native in the third one. And so, you know, I love InfoQ and I love all the work we do here because, you know, I think, you know, talking about Kubernetes, talking about cloud native is one of those things I think this audience really gets. And so, so what are the implications of being cloud native to your database itself? Um, you know, can it actually, you know, attach to storage and, and act naturally? Is it, is it distributed and can it, you know, run across multiple different pods or is it just going to be one big pod that's dedicated to that? Thinking through those challenges will actually help you understand which database is correct for you. Okay. And so that's kind of like the deployment model, right? So, you know, how you're going to actually, you know, sell this thing, how you're going to deploy it. And, and so let's, let's kind of move into to workload. And, and I think this is really, to me, the most important part. Um, you know, I think it's really easy to think through like, okay, what's the difference between a graph database and a time series database and where are you going to use those things as opposed to like a relational and a document model? And I think that's where a lot of people get tripped up. Like, do I use, do I use a document store or do I use a relational model? I think that's a big question I get a lot of, you know, um, I, I get a lot of questions around like, well, why can't I just do analytics in, in, in an operational store? Or why can't I just do, you know, the, the transactions in my data warehouse? Well, there's trade-offs between those two things. And there's reasons why we have different databases to meet kind of the, the needs or the requirements of different workloads. And I think, you know, that that is definitely, I think, the most important part to think about. And when I think about like the, the, you know, the document store versus the relational model, I, I, I go to, you know, it's a model versus a store, honestly. Um, and I think about, you know, data modeling versus kind of document model. Um, and, and I think, you know, the, the traditional world of data modeling, you know, the ERDs and these sort of things, and I, I used to live in the, in, the, in the data model world. I, I don't, I, the, the document model, I get it. I understand the agility and all these things. It, it's, it's, it's just less structured from like the pure constraints that you can put on things. You know, understanding, you know, strong data types and, and relationships between objects. Um, you know, understanding and, and enforcing referential integrity and, and letting the database do that for you and not having to code for that. Um, being able to, you know, join things and, and do aggregate views or materialize views. You can do that with the, with the relational model. Some of the things you can't do with the relational model, relational model and it's really, really powerful for the, for the document model is like, look at, I can be very agile in, in the way that these things work and I can move very quickly because, well, I have more freedom. I don't have this kind of strong enforcement of integrity of, of these things. And when I think about kind of the document model versus or the document store versus kind of the relational data model, I typically think of what the application is doing. And I think of, you know, on one side, you kind of have like a, a system of access, like look at, I know what the data is. I know how I'm going to access it. It's not going to change a whole lot. It may differ, it may differ in terms of, you know, the, 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 the relationships between various different items in there. Um, but I know what it's going to be. And I'm not going to have a whole lot of like, you know, weird queries and new queries going on across that data, right? I kind of know what my query is. And I, I think about that in, in the document store. Whereas on the doc, in the, the relational model, you're going to actually think through like, I'm going to have a whole lot of different things a way of accessing this thing, right? And so I always think it's kind of like, it's a little bit easier to kind of go between, you know, well, SQL on the relational side and, and the data warehouse, whereas like you're kind of doing, you know, you're, you're tabling things in the document store to actually make it work within, you know, say some of the analytical kind of queries that you're going to do. So it really comes down to kind of what you want to actually accomplish um, with that data and, and the control you want over things. Now, I love it that the relational data model can control the integrity of the data itself. Um, and, and, you know, it's, you know, it's strongly typed, the relationships are maintained, again, referential integrity, these sort of things. And so not having to code that into the application. I feel is very powerful, but again, the document store can be very, very powerful in its in its own way. And I think the other kind of area where where this does, uh, I think you need to start thinking about like, okay, what am I going to use? One of the other is, I, I think about the number of documents that you're going to have in a document store, and the number of kind of templates that you would have for for say documents, right? Like, and so if you're going to go about five or eleven, you know, how hard is it to actually maintain that? You know, and, and but if it's a simple application, great. Like it, it's it, they're amazing. On the on the relational and the, these kind of data models, these more complex, you can you can continue to add, right? And the migrations become a lot easier. Um, it's kind of more one to one. You have a map, right? And so I, I just think like thinking about the, the 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 size of models, the number of models that you're going to have, 
is another thing that that you may want to take into consideration as you make a choice between something like that. Um, now, the the this 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 point around asset and, and transactions is, is something I think is is pretty important to actually understand. And and I you know I I contend that probably nine out of ten developers have no idea what what the isolation level of the database really means or why it's of a, a value to them. Um, but I think it's actually pretty important because you know you just understanding the tools that you're using can can provide a whole lot of value to you. It's kind of like, hey man, if I knew how turbo works in my car, I know exactly how to like speed it up and use my gas pedal to engage that and when not to and these sort of things, right? So like, understand these things are actually pretty important because I think a lot of a lot of database vendors just talk about, oh, we have acid transactions. Great, yes, atomicity, consistency, isolation, durability. Um, understanding what that means and are there ranges of acid, I think is one of those things. And, and the range really comes out of the I in acid, isolation. And what is that isolation level of your database? And there's, with, with various different isolation levels of a database, different things can go wrong. You have dirty reads, non-repeatable reads, write skews, phantom reads. Basically what this means is that, you know, is it gonna isolate transactions so they don't overlap each other? And so before one transaction is complete, the other one is already started and it's making changes. And so how does the database protect from kind of things happening all at the same time, all at the same time on, on the same data? Now there's a whole level of different kind of isolation levels that, that are available to people. Um, if you go to jepson.io slash consistency, um, Kyle and the, and the Jepson team, it's pretty much Kyle, uh, has a really, really great explanation of the various different isolation levels and what can go wrong within these things. It gets a bit of cranial at times, but it's definitely like my go-to in terms of understanding, you know, how these things work. And I think that the left side of this tree is really what we typically think about with databases. Now, if you look at kind of different types of databases, they'll have a, a, a default isolation level. Um, and, and default isolation level is basically just out of the box what I'm going to get. And so these are the kind of mapping isolation levels to the various different issues that can go wrong with your data. And it's really from top to bottom in terms of, you know, the, the level of isolation. Now, listen, if you want to tune your isolation level in your database because you need higher performance, that's that's why people typically will tune the isolation level, but they don't understand that there could be issues with their data underneath. So the trade-offs really come in, and, and the decision point really comes into basically, you know, what's the value of that data? How correct does it need to be? And I think that's one of those things, thinking through that in, in your workload and what does it mean for your database? And can I actually change these things or do I just need straight up like serializable, right? And so those are the various different things. And typically people think about these. I think most developers, again, just use the default level, whatever is important to them and, and, and whatever that is for that particular database, right? Um, but understanding isolation levels, I think is another, another key thing. Um, I, I like to think about scale of applications as well. And so, you know, on day one, pe people don't typically think of scale. You know, they don't think about how many users they're going to have. They don't think about how large the database is going to have. They aren't going to think about, you know, transactions per second in the millions, right? They're just thinking about just coding some business logic. But I think it's actually pretty important to think about these things up front. You know, where, where are my users going to be? What are the latencies going to be? Um, and, and thinking of these things up front will help us eventually kind of avoid technical debt or kind of re-architecting things in the future, right? Because I think scale in a database and, and, and you know, the efficiency of scale typically is dealt with in one of two ways and in, in kind of the, the state of the art of kind of our legacy apps, right? And the legacy databases. Like there's vertical scale, which is basically like, look at, I had this thing and I just, I just got a bigger server, right? And I have more memory and I have more compute. So I've scaled up that database to actually deal with more transactions and, and store more data, right? Typically, people think about horizontal scale as well, and so it's just like we're 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 taking the database and we're going to split it up into these shards. And I've never met a person on this planet that actually enjoyed sharding a database. I, I'd love to know if there's somebody out there that likes that, but um, typically also very difficult. And so this is what I mean by like thinking through like, okay, at what point am I going to scale? And and remember, scale is not just about size or volume of data. It can be about volume of transactions as well, which actually gets pretty important. Scale can also be about, you know, being able to meet the needs of customers in, you know, faraway lands. You know, are we going to actually eventually get there? And I think it's important to start off thinking about those things. Because say in a year from now, you are successful and you have to go through this. What is the operational overhead? What's the pain of actually adding a new shard? What about a year from after that when you actually have to shard three times or five or seven? 
And then you have this long going long term maintenance of, of this database. How many people does it take to actually maintain these things? And so while it may seem simple now to basically, like, oh, I'll just use it Postgres and I'll shard it and all these things. Looking through these databases, there's a, there's a range of new databases actually that basically take away this the, the pain of sharding. Um, who have automated that. And I think as we move towards, you know, cloud native and, and these sort of systems, automating towards those things are actually pretty, pretty important. Because ultimately, and, and this is that that third part about scale, you know, what about regional scale? What am I gonna do? Have like two databases and then synchronize these things between two various different regions. Maybe it's, you know, West Coast of the United States and somewhere in Europe. And well, well, what are the issues here? You know, like what happens when things go down? Um, can you scale both reads and writes in the various different regions? You know, there are cloud databases where you can scale reads, but you can't scale writes. Um, and taking those things into consideration. I'm not saying make all your decisions based on something that's gonna be three years from now, or even two or even six months from now. You just kind of gotta get a, 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 an application built. And I think it, that that part starts with, do you have the right language? You know, are you SQL or not? And I think that's a pretty, pretty, pretty important one. But thinking about scale from a geographic point of view is actually pretty important as well, because Latency and the speed of light is definitely an issue, especially as you start to, you know, deploy your things globally, right? And so I think geographic scale is another vector to think about when we're thinking these. All of this is great, um, but ultimately when you do get to this geographic scale, uh, there's a whole crazy web of new data privacy and compliance laws out there, you know, do, do records need to be resident in a certain country? Uh, like these sort of things, and so like, thinking through regulatory compliance eventually as well as, as you build out your business and whatever it is it's gonna be. The database can play a key role in that. Do you wanna actually mitigate you know, where data lives in your application logic or would you rather the database just deal with that? And so that's just another kind of key area to think about. I like to think a lot about, and, and we have a lot of conversations with people about business continuity. And business continuity is really kind of you know, asking yourself how important is it for this application to be online and available? And what are my requirements around amount of time it can be gone or can't at all, right? Um, what are the things that I that can survive? What are the failure domains that I need to be able to survive for this particular application? Um, should I be able to survive an entire cloud provider going out? Should I be able to survive, you know, a, a regional failure? Because I tell you what, cloud providers go down. You know, last, I think it was February, January, um, you know, AWS East went out, right? And so are, is your business gone and can you survive it? How much time can you be out? Um, how do you come back from a failure? And, and once there is this kind of, you know, once you come back, and, and this is really around business continuity and, and what does it mean for you and your application uh, and your business around uptime requirements? And, and uptime isn't always about, you know, failure too, by the way, it's about, you know, unplanned or planned downtime as well. You know, am I gonna, do I wanna make sure that things are, you know, uh, you know, up to date all the time? Am I taking things down in the middle of the night? And, or am I avoiding dot releases of software because I'm afraid of putting them in production? I, I can't handle the, the, the planned downtime around that, right? And so I think those are all things to consider uh, and, and understanding your own kind of uptime requirements or, or really your, your requirements around business continuity a great question to ask and not something that people ask on day one. Like I said, typically on day one, you're just building an application. You're like, give me a database because I need to start building. You aren't thinking about, oh gosh, what are my business continuity requirements? Um, but it is actually something to think about because ultimately in the end, it will cause you either A, technical debt or uh, increased operations based on a wrong decision. Or you could simplify those things, or maybe it's just simple to use, you don't need that. These are the questions to ask though, as you choose this. The, the final is kind of what, you know, what are the resources around these things? And, and so what does this actually talk, cost, right? And so, you know, I think, you know, this, this concept around open source and what does it mean, you know, like, okay, there's a software license or there's commercial open source and I can just go get this thing, it's free to start and then I have to pay somebody or it's like, maybe it's full cloud service where it's like, you know, I just, I get this thing, I just use it. You know, open source has really changed in terms of the cost of what it is now. I don't think people really download software and, and install and manage them themselves. I think most people, they just want to consume as a managed service. So how important is, is, is you know, this equation of open source from a pure consumption point of view? I think it's still super important in terms of, you know, size of the community of people that are using things of people that can actually work with you on these things. Um, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, but, but I think the consumption is really a, a managed service. I, 
I love that code repositories are open. Uh, you can build derivative works off of them. And so I think from a consumption point of view, open source has, has really changed. But there's a lot of kind of hidden costs when you do charge or you do go choose a cloud database. And there's a lot of cloud services out there. Um, but I think, you know, getting into kind of, you know, beyond the license, what are the other things that I'm going to have to pay for? You know, how much is, is storage charged separately? Am I paying for IOPS? What is it going to cost to actually run this thing in multiple different regions? What are my egress costs? Because I'm synchronizing data between two regions eventually. Um, you know, how much does it cost to do backups? And then there's the integration points. Do I need different software to do CDC? How's this thing going to work with my data lake or data science repositories? You know, and, and so can you do a lot of the things that you need to do in the database that are going to allow you to avoid these things? And so the, the service itself is going to have a lot of different costs. Thinking through each of those, again, is going to actually help you choose which database to choose. But I think there's not the usual cost kind of, you know, calculations as well, like what is this thing going to cost in people? Um, you know, is SREs or operators actually maintaining this thing? How much time am I going to have to spend actually dealing with the database as opposed to just writing my code and my application? And then what's the cost of downtime? you know um you know planned and unplanned you know what's the cost of not upgrading a database over time and you know maybe you have issues with it um are you going to want to keep things up to date um and, and you know it's not it's not the problems that happen in the middle of the night where you got to call somebody in it's problems in the middle of the day with these things and so being resilient and having this business continuity so that you know you know can you automate out failure can you have active active systems these sort of things right so there's lots of reasons why you know different cost calculations come into this. So nine questions beyond our own familiarity, beyond like, hey, I'm just gonna use what I used in my last project. How will the database support my app architecture? How is it gonna integrate everything? Is it gonna fit and, and, and enable my deployment style, right? Am I deploying as a service, that sort of stuff? Um, where will I deal with data integrity? And are there data re integrity requirements? Am I doing that code or let the database do that? What are the scale requirements ultimately? today and next year what is what does business continuity mean for us are we going to be global where will my users be and then ultimately i think you know what is my budget and budget is not just the license or the cost of this thing it's all the things around it that, that are additional costs and it's also time and and people to actually manage these sort of things and i think those are nine good questions to ask when we're choosing a database on day one of you know building out whatever application it's going to be that you actually want to build out you know, at, at, here at Cockroach Labs, you know, we think about these things differently. Um, you know, we, we can implement, you know, one single logical database that spans multiple regions or multiple AZs so that you have this business continuity. You know, scale in Cockroach is really simple. Just spin up a new node and the database, you know, deals with this. There's no sharding anymore with this sort of thing. Um, you know, we can do this across broad regions. We can guarantee, you know, sub 100 millisecond, you know, latencies for queries. We can scale both reads and writes. And, and we've built into the database a lot of the core things that are going to that are necessary for you to integrate with all the things that are around you, um, including security frameworks too. By the way, that's a whole other area. But I don't I don't think the database is going to be even a valid if it if it doesn't have the core kind of security components. And all this is done in in something that's basically Postgres. This is just relational database, and so we're compatible with Postgres. So it's kind of like Postgres without the the, the manual scale or or, or active passive and make it active active and that sort of thing. And so that's what I like to think about. And the reason I joined Cockroach is I saw something that was, it was truly, truly different. So um, you can go create a, an instance of Cockroach right now. You can create a serverless instance. Again, it's just like having an instance of Postgres. Um, it's free up to five gigabytes of storage and 250 million request units a month. Um, so I, I, I mean, if you, if you all want to go sign up and start a cluster right now and choose your own database i tell you what it's going to hit on a lot of the things that we just spoke about there so that's my presentation um like i said i think we just kept it within a half hour Srini. um but i'm happy to take questions yeah thanks Jim. thanks for excellent presentation uh, everybody please if you have any questions please post them in the uh, questions tab on the control panel and uh, jim will uh, uh, respond to your questions yeah, Jim, uh, while uh, the attendees are uh, going to post any questions, uh, I have a couple of questions that we can uh, start us off. Uh, by the way, Great. first of all, you know, database, uh, I just want to kind of, um, kind of summarize the key takeaway from this presentation. Like database, are, they can no longer be the single isolated instances running on a DB server with no failover capabilities, right? So, so database need to become first class citizen components in the overall architecture stack 
to start supporting the applications that are already cloud native, right? So we cannot have cloud native apps connecting to traditional databases. Uh, that's not going to give us the right scalability or right performance and right failover uh, capabilities, right? So, so cloud database uh, uh, nicely complement the cloud native applications. Yeah, and, and oh. Srini, I, I largely agree with that. And and sometimes in certain workloads, maybe you don't need to be cloud native. And I'm perfectly fine with that too. You know what I mean? I think it's kind of one of those things like not every, you, you don't need like the, you don't need a tank in every battle. You know what I mean? Right. Like, and so sometimes you just need something simple and, and that's okay too. I, yeah, I just yeah, think as developers, we've got to think about all these things. Exactly. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. Like uh, uh, Martin Fowler always says, right? So, the first uh, principle of distributed computing is do not distribute your objects, right? So, you know, so un <laughs> unless, right. you need to, unless you need to, right? So, right. That's right. Yeah. We have some questions coming up, but let me uh, kind of you know, start us off with a couple of questions uh, uh, that will probably everybody has on their mind. So, what should uh, I know you covered already a couple of these. So, what should the application developers keep in mind in terms of data modeling, database design uh, when they're working on for a, for a traditional monolithic app? Which may be the solution for some of the apps, or a cloud-native distributed app. So, so what should they keep in mind, you know, when they're working on a specific type of app, in terms of database design? Yeah, yeah, it's great, and I think database design is one of these lost arts, honestly, Srini. Like, you know, maybe I'm too old or something, but you know, when I was in grad school or when I was in undergrad, we had a whole database design class, and you know, I remember like the, you know, the third normal form and the fourth normal, fourth normal form. These things were like difficult for me to understand. And the normalization of a database is basically like, how do you kind of limit the amount of storage it's going to take to actually store the data? That's basically kind of what normalization is. And I think normalization is actually very valid in the world of microservices because you don't want huge, massive amounts of data going between multiple different microservices. And so how do you minimize like the size of communication packages that are going between various different services? And that's all around normalizing your objects, normalizing your data, and ultimately normalizing your database. I love that question because it, it, we're coming back to what was once important before is important again. And I think you know that like being good database designers, I think is actually pretty important, but you don't have to think about it as like being a DBA. You can think about it as just being a good object designer. Like, okay, great. Like, what is this, what do I need to do but at the same time, let me let me reduce complexity and let's let the let's let the the data do the work for us. And I think those are those are kind of those are important things to think about when you're thinking about modeling and and making these things work. Yeah, definitely, the database design has become a lost art, right? So we need to bring it back. It has. <laughs> yeah. Right. Srini, I, I ask you, do you know what cardinality of a query is? Oh. <laughs> I know, like I don't know, I don't remember on top of my head, but you are right. Exactly, we forgot what it was as developers. But cardinality of a query is like, if I ask for data, am I doing a full table scan, or am I getting back exactly what I want? Like, what's the cardinality? How much of it? Those things are important when we're dealing with microservices and distributed systems, y'all, because like, you don't want to pull back like huge. You don't want to pull back a terabyte of data from your query. So how do you actually limit that? And I think databases and the relational data model is a real beautiful way of thinking through those sort of things. And I think it's, it, this, this is what I mean, Srini, and I think it's a lost art, dude. Yeah, yeah. relational database, are, I mean, sometimes they get the bad rap, you know, because of all the NoSQL uh, database, uh, you know, uh, evolution, but uh, but they're still the foundation of the database management systems, right? So, like, yeah. you know, whether, uh, whether you use a relational database or not, you still have need to have some kind of schema, some kind of structure, right? So, yeah, we yes. do have a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, Jim, maybe we can jump onto those. The first question is uh, from Akhilesh. Uh, so he's wondering uh, if CockroachDB is a relational database or not. So uh, yes, absolutely. Cockroach is, uh, we're basically Postgres. We're wire compatible with Postgres. We implement the SQL syntax. It's just that, you know, as a developer, as a, as a you know, as a, as, as a dev, like, yeah, it's just, it's just SQL. It's a relational database. The database itself, though, is the execution layer, the storage layer, everything underneath, completely redone. It just it just implements the SQL syntax up front. So yes, it is a relational database, but distributed. Yes, thank you. Uh, another question from Akhilesh as well. You know, so uh, so he's wondering whether to use a cloud cloud relational database like Cockroach DB, or a cloud NoSQL mm -hmm. database like. Uh, Data Stacks, Cassandra, or Atlas. 
Yeah. So uh, great question. So that's really kind of two questions because it's like I, I spoke a little bit about like the relational model versus the document store. And I think document stores are great for like when you need to get very fast access and you're not going to change the queries a whole lot. You kind of know what your access patterns are going to be. Um, there's a couple of really good articles out there on that. Whereas kind of the relational model allows you to kind of run more like really odd queries against that data too. Like, you know, I mean, think think about like, what do, what do data scientists use? What's their first line of offense, man? It, it's SQL, you know what I mean? Like they want to use SQL against the data. So like, I always think about the complexity of the application where it fits in the, in the larger sequence of what you're doing. I'm a relational person. Like I go straight for relational because I don't want to have to code in a, a referential integrity. I don't want to have to code for views and aggregate views and joins. And like, let the database do that work, man. Like there's a reason why the relational database is still very, very powerful. And I think the document store is good for, you know, a subset of workloads. Cassandra, on the other hand, Cassandra is an amazing, also an amazing database. And I think the, the speed at which we can get access data across the planet, honestly, it's amazing. Like, I think the pandemic would have been horrible if we didn't have Cassandra because all the streaming services, they, they use it like too extensively. Can you do transactions in Cassandra? And I think that's one of the things that I didn't talk about in the, in the session there, but in, in the context of document stores too, transactions, Rights are important, dude. And so, like, can you get you know rights done in 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 each of these things? Can you do it in a document store? You can do it. Are you going to be guaranteed correct? I don't know. Like, but do you need that, Cassandra? You're going to get really good transactions. You can. It's just that you kind of need to with with Cassandra when you implement it, you have to know what your data model is going to be, and that's it. And then you don't change it. Like that's what you're implementing because it's tied to the way things are stored. It it isn't very agile ultimately in the end. And you kind of need a PhD in Cassandra to extract out all the crazy amounts of value from it. It's pretty awesome. And it can do some really amazing things. It's fairly complex to kind of manage and operate. And I, that's what I think about. Yeah, definitely. I agree with you, Jimon. I think this question is a very interesting question, right? Just like an application, if you have uh, to write an application, right? You know, depending on your requirements, you will either choose a monolithic app solution, which is still an option, or you, you uh, want to make it a microservice or maybe you even want to make it a serverless function, right? So uh, once you make the decision, so that's the design side of the things, and then you still have to make a call on, uh, am I going to host this application on-premise in my company, or am I going to host this in the cloud, right? So with the database, it's the same thing, like you mentioned, you know, pick your database uh, type first, depending on what kind of data you need to manage, what kind of security and performance requirements you have, and how much integrity you need, eventual versus uh, immediate consistency, right? So once you decide on the type of the database, CockroachDB or Cassandra, then you still have to figure out, you know, is it better for me to host it on-premise? With, with, it, with it comes all the maintenance and the, you know, uh, DevOps uh, overhead, or should I just host it on the cloud, right? So I think that's a really yeah. good question uh, uh, that uh, at least was asked. So, okay. I don't see any other questions, Jim, but uh, we can uh, uh, kind of cover a couple of other topics I wanted to, uh, briefly uh, sure. kind of mentioned in the Q&A section. So can you talk about the, the kind of some best practices in uh, managing database changes in production? Because I uh, you know database is kind of still not there in terms of uh, uh, blue-green deployments or in terms of rollbacks, you know, so that the application developers are familiar with, you know, on the, on the API side. So what are some best practices in terms of managing database changes in production, database versioning, uh, being able to roll back any uh, production features if needed? Yeah. Yeah, so this, I mean, it's always a great question. And, you know, I think we've been struggling with this for really quite some time. And state of the art for legacy databases, well, to do a schema change, you had to take the thing down, change the schema and bring it back. Um, thankfully, what's happened over time with distributed systems, these sort of things, like the same way we do rolling upgrades, we can do online schema changes too. So you're actually making schema changes, you know, in production, you can do that live, you know. Now, how do you propagate these things between, you know, test, you know, acceptance tests, performance tests, and into these other environments? I think you just part, you treat it as part of your overall kind of CI CD workflow. Um, and, and how do you actually make these schemas apply as you deploy the database in each of these environments? Um, and tying that schema to, you know, the same kind of artifacts that are going along those, those channels, I think is very important. The beauty is, you know, you can go through each of the environments, right? You have your whole workflow. The beauty was, I, I'm sorry, I work at Cockroach, but the beauty with something like Cockroach is like, I don't need to take the production system down to, to change the, the schema. I, I, I can do it live. 
And the database will actually mitigate the changes between all these things and, and actually perform that upgrade for you. And so I think there's some really cool things and some advances in databases that, that kind of eliminate the, the effect of that. So don't, you don't have to be afraid of it anymore, right? You can just, you can go right. ahead and do it. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. And also databases are not exactly like the applications which are more uh, stateless, right? So at, at one point yeah. in the life cycle, you cannot really go back, right? You know, once you uh, deploy a new production uh, uh, version of database and you uh, let the consumers use it for a few days and you have all the new data yeah. with the new model and new schema, so you cannot really undo that, right? So, so there needs to be some kind of a good... Uh, compensation uh, strategy on the database, which is more difficult than on That's the right. Side, right? So application, you can just That's go right. back to the previous version, but, uh, but the database, you can't do that, right? So, okay. Uh, yeah, right. Akhilesh has a couple more questions. You know, um, uh, his question is like, do banks, like financial institutions, prefer cloud databases? Uh, so it's hard to talk about all the banks in one general sweeping motion, but I think there's kind of, you know, two types of bank. I don't think many of them, I think smaller banks, mid-sized banks are using public cloud providers, like they're using AWS or GCP and they can do that. And I think they're making it work. I think the large banks uh, and what we see in our engagement with them is they're they're running things on-prem, um, but they're running things on-prem and they're setting themselves up as their own internal kind of public cloud. Like it's set up internally as a public cloud provider where like people have push button access to a service. Like we're we're a service in one of the largest banks on the planet right now. And I think we have like 130 different workloads, you know, people started a workload, but for them, it's all push button access to kind of things. So the same way they, they have their own private, like version of a public cloud. Um, and so I think it's, it's different between each of the various different uh, the banks. They still have a whole lot of legacy on-prem mainframe stuff going on though, man, you know, like that stuff is going to take a while to get out. But I think, Anything net new is kind of going into, you know, these cloud native platforms that are predicated on Kubernetes and, you know, hosted services and that sort of stuff. It's just private to the bank is what's going on typically. Yeah, exactly. You're right. So from a performance standpoint, I know cloud is a better option for banks, but from a security standpoint, is that cloud option uh, kind of PCI compliant or SOX compliant or, you know, uh, you know, the European, you know, I forgot the standard you know, the compliant, right? So, so the compliance definitely comes yeah. to yeah, and, and they want control over the environment too. Like for instance, like, you know, we're working with another bank where what they do is they they repave servers every couple of weeks, which means basically they take the server down to bare metal and then they reinstall the operating system. They reinstall like all the way up the application stack because they want to make sure they have the most recent stuff and they want to make sure there's nothing bad going on in that machine. I re-image my Mac every once in a while too because it's just so easy to do it. And honestly, it helps with the performance. I don't know why, it just does. Uh, and so they're doing the same thing, but across their fleets of servers. Uh, and, and they love us because, well, they just bring down node by node and there's no impact to production workloads, right? And so um, so we work with them on that and that sort of thing as well. They like the control. Yes, definitely. I think that's how most organizations should be like, you, know, you should be able to recreate your environment, you know, on the fly as much as possible, right? So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yep. We have another question from uh, uh, Praveen. Uh, he is wondering, uh, I know you talked about sharding and you know uh, some people you know developers you know are not too thrilled with the sharding uh, uh, solutions but so with sharding how well does the cockroach db perform with joins uh it's not a, it's really not an issue for us at all like we don't shard actually cockroach doesn't shard the database we we actually break records down into ranges of data uh, and you know our join performance is basically very close to what you're going to get out of monolithic kind of instance of a database. Um, you know, depending on what you're doing and depending on where data lives. I mean, there's always you know performance optimizations around those sort of things. Uh, yeah, but in a native sharding of a regular database, yeah, joins become really difficult, dude. Like because you're joining across physical instances. You know, so if you're going to do that, automate it. And so that's what we choose to do on the cockroach side. Right. Yeah. You want to make sure the data does not. Uh get uh, sharded into different uh, physical uh, locations. Uh, you, know, right. you don't want table A to be in one location, table B to be another location for the same type of same uh, criteria. Right. When you try to join those, yeah, they will be uh, very slow, right? So, okay. Thanks, Jim. I don't see any questions. Yeah, if anybody has any questions, please post them in the uh, Q&A uh, section, right? So, uh, I know somebody had raised their hand earlier in the presentation, but I don't see them on the call anymore. So. 
Everybody, if you have any questions, please uh, type them in the Q&A section. Uh, Jim, like one uh, last question, you know, unless uh, any questions comes up, uh, come up from the audience. So what are some of the emerging trends happening in the cloud database? You know, you talked about a few things in the presentation, but uh, any other, yeah. uh, anything else you, you want to highlight? Yeah, you look at it, I, there's an emerging trend and it's something that I think, you know, here at Cockroach, we think a lot about. And, you know, we move towards having a serverless version of our database, which I think is really cool because it allows developers to get kind of like, okay, I'm only paying for the transactions that I have which is great. Like I don't need to pay for a big, you know, instance of a server run on it and pay for the whole thing for the whole month. I'm not even using the thing. I, I love consumption model. And I think serverless and these principles when tied, when, when, when applied to software, it looks really, it's, it's, I think it's very, very amazing. Um, because I think I like consumption models. I think ultimately in the end, you know, what we're building to here and what I think databases need to be is just a SQL API in the cloud connection string in the sky. You know, I'm 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 just coding against it, just same way I code against you know Twilio or Okta or whatever. Like, I think the database should be the same thing. I don't think any of us should ever have to worry about upgrading or managing the thing or like nobody wants to deal with that. They just want to write a SQL query. You know, let me change my schema. You know, online in production, I I don't want to have to go to a DBA to do that. You know, like give me the tools to interact with it to do the things I need to do but take away all the encumbrance of any sort of operations. Just guarantee the thing's gonna be working. Guarantee that I'm gonna get, you know, sub 100 millisecond queries all over the planet. And I want endpoints all over the place. And I don't wanna have to choose my endpoint based on my data. And, and when I look forward, you know, five, seven, 10 years from now, I really think the database can be a SQL API in the cloud. And I, I love the concept. And that's that, you know, that's that's the kind of the, the North Star I think about when I think about, when I think about database. It's a bit far out there, but you know, I think it's I think it's 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 plausible. Yeah, definitely. As you mentioned, you know, databases uh, most of the times outlast the applications, right? <laughs> you can have uh, Java, you know, pretty popular at one time of the, you know, or uh, some other time it's like Node.js or something else or Kotlin or whatever, right? So, but the database are database, right? So, you need uh, them to manage your data, and they're not going uh, going away anytime soon, right? So, that's right. Absolutely. Yeah, Jim, we have one more question from uh, Radoslav. Uh, the question is a consumption model is nice, but you really need to be careful about what you do or the invoice will be very high. So, so yeah, so basically yeah. cost will, will be a consideration, right? So Yeah, so smart vendors around this. So we did this with uh, Cockroach DB serverless. We actually allow you to set a spend limit. So you're never gonna spend any more of that. And what we do is we'll throttle back usage so it's your choice, you know what I mean? Like, you know, we'll throttle so you still have enough kind of, you know, transactions per second, you know, for the rest of the month, you know, but, you know, you're never going to get a bill over what you choose as your spend. We, we do that. Yeah, we, yeah. Yeah. Nobody wants to surprise from AWS at the end of the month or GCP or Azure or whatever, like, because your serverless service went crazy, right? And so but I think that's something that the we all have to figure out. Yeah, yeah, you want to definitely constantly monitor how it's being used and uh, and kind of make sure that uh, uh, you know the value is there for the cost, right? So and demand spend limits. Exactly. You know, uh, it is a good thing with cloud is at least you know, you know, there's a price for everything, there's a cost for everything. Yeah. On premise, you know, like we don't even know, and a lot of companies don't even measure, right? Don't even uh, estimate the cost. So a lot of the the same money is being spent, but we don't even know, right? So. Yeah. Uh, and cloud at least, you know, you get a bill, you know, so, right? <laughs> yep. Oh, we have one more question, uh, Jim, it's from Akhilesh again. How much workload is reduced for DBAs working on on-premise database after shifting to the cloud DB? So basically, uh, what is the DBA role with the cloud database yeah. in the picture? Yeah. So I think in general, just a cloud service, um, I think if I would as like maybe a three to five X savings and resource costs, that's, that's cockroach or not. Like, Consume things as managed services, y'all. Like it is so much cheaper to do. Who needs to stand up a server and then install Linux and install the thing and then make sure it's running and then you know integrate that with my Knox so I make sure it's up and running all the time and then actually manage that thing. I mean, unless you have like some really crazy like security requirements, use a cloud service. It, it is just so much easier and it's just it, it's exponentially cheaper to actually manage. There's just countless different things that come into play there. Um, and I think that's across all software, right, Srini? I think everybody's, I think that's what people are doing managed services for. They don't, nobody wants to basically maintain and manage these things. That, that's not that's not what I do. I code, you know what I mean? Like, 
And so just let that stuff go. Let the cloud provider do it. Let the, let's gain value from the economy of scale that they can give to you. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's cost effective. It's uh, um, makes you more productive. You focus on what you need to do, not all the other, uh, you know, the plumbing stuff and the boilerplate stuff, right? So that's right. Definitely. That's right. So cool. Okay, uh, that's the last question, Jim. Yeah, I think the, yeah. those are the questions we have so far. So uh, it's been a very informative session and very informal. You know, uh, you know, we definitely love and respect your informality and you know your you know <laughs> like the, the developer speaking with the developers uh, type of approach. I want to thank you again uh, for the, your uh, time today. I also want to thank everybody who has joined this uh, presentation today, this webinar, and for uh, submitting your questions. Uh, it's a great, uh, uh, you know, interactive you know, type of uh, meeting today. So you are the main reason. Again, uh, you developer community is the main reason why we host these events. Uh, so subject matter experts like Jim can share with you what's coming up, what you should be uh, kind of watching out for uh, in the software uh, development world. Jim, do you have any final thoughts before we wrap up? No, just thank you, Srini. I love doing this with you. Um, it's always enjoyable. I, I thank you everybody for sticking around and asking questions because uh, I learn too in these things. And I think that's th those are always my favorite sessions and I hope this was valuable to everybody. So thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks, Jim. I know, again, one of the attendees is saying that very good webinar. Thank you, you know, so thanks, Jim. <laughs> thanks for oh, your thanks. time and expertise on that. So, so thank you everybody. We will uh, see you next time. Thank you.